schedule. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Hernandez, the One Health Tech Manchester Hub and the Hair Plus Data community in Manchester welcomes you to this fantastic panel discussion about the importance of women in data and digital health. Uh, we have invited three fantastic women who work in the interface of uh, these different fields, and they will share with us today some of the insights about their career journey and how other women have supported them as well. Uh, we will discuss how women should and are already enriching hot topics in tech like automation, um, information governance, inter interoperability, data security, and so on and so on all the different topics in health uh, in which data uh, has something to, to be involved. We are very happy to have them with us uh, to reflect on this course and hopefully this will allow um, their insights and experiences to empower um, other women and uh, to keep spreading the voice. We know that we have to keep um, working on this and empowering and supporting each other as women. So if we can go to the following slide, please, um, just to tell you that uh, the One Health Tech Manchester Hub is led by, by my friends and colleagues, Charlotte Lewis, who works at Mills and Reef on the legal side of things in health tech. Currently, she's on annual leave, so she's not able to join us today. My colleague, Bernadette Clark, and myself, Bernie, over to you. To you. Hopefully, you can introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Just very briefly, because I can do it on the Hair Plus data slides as well. But um, I really enjoy working with Alex and Charlotte. Charlotte's on, on mat leave at the moment. Um, and we, we um, oh, Charlotte, Charlotte's there. Excellent. Charlotte Great. is here. Fabulous. That's Welcome, fabulous. Charlotte. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Wonderful. Brilliant, Charlotte. Um, yeah, I'm Bernadette Clark. Everyone calls me Bernie. Um, I do One Health Tech and I also um, am on the uh, committee for Her Plus Data as well. I'm the Managing Director of Evolutions NHS Business. Thank you, Bernie. Thanks for all the work that you have put uh, into this event and aligning all the That's agenda the and the panel speakers. Thank you uh, for, for that. Uh, um, well, as I said, my name is Alex. I currently work as a Health Tech Policy Advisor working in NHS shared business services in the digital and IT category team. My background is working in public health, health economics and health policy. I live in Manchester since 2018 and I am a One Health Tech member since 2020 when the pandemic started. And I am also a proud mom of a 20 month old baby girl. So if you hear her in the background, is here. Um, okay, if we move on, Nikki, thank you so much as well. I want to uh, give thanks uh, for all your support in the logistics and, and, and all the, the support that you have provided in the organization of this event. Um, okay, let me just start with a brief introduction of what is One Health Tech. Um, so uh, those who haven't heard from us will know a little bit more of the things that move us the, uh, and, and, and a bit of, of our mission really. So One Health Tech is a grassroots volunteer-led global community that exists to support be better quality, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in health tech. Our community comes from many different sectors, countries, and backgrounds, and it includes from healthcare providers to startups, corporates, academics, and charities, and all um, the wide range of professions, really. So since the pandemic started, we updated our strategy to increase the impact of the activities that we do to achieve higher inclusion and diversity. And this new strategy is based on activities planned by squads working in different areas like engagement, impact, among others. And we also work based on campaigns and um, we cover different uh, activities from events, workshops, research initiatives, and discussions like this one bringing together um, um, this community. If we move on please to the uh, next slide. Um, I will hand over in a minute to Bernie so she can give us a quick overview of um, her plus data community. But before that, I would like just to share a couple of interesting figures to explore how um, we all know that there is a lack of diversity in this sector and we just need to keep working on that. And that is uh, precisely what brings us together today. Um, 
we know that there is a lack of diversity at different levels in different sectors, all working in the health tech um, community. And we just need uh, to open our eyes and, and, and keep working um, for this really. So uh, particularly shocking figures in the area of data and informatics. And uh, obviously the lack of diversity is not just in women, but also um, within um, ethnic minorities, for example. Um, so there is a lot uh, that we can still uh, progress on, but this is only to motivate um, a discussion. If we move on to the following um, slide, please, uh, just to show you that we have identified some challenges and solutions at the back of um, different research uh, documents and also survey data that we have collected as a community. We all know, and this is not new to us, that the different challenges affecting the sector is the imposter syndrome. Um, academia is the, uh, uh, shockingly the worst performing of, of all the sectors. There is a lack of inclusive culture, and this is most felt by CEOs and directors and there is a lack of leadership and, and, and uh, um, knowledge in terms of, of, of the sector peer networks and uh, you know all the all the people who can mentor and support um, the solutions that we have identified mentorship has uh, been um, identified as, as, a, as a big one uh, we need to support each other we need to focus on confidence leadership and role models and hopefully this discussion will um, sum into this. Um, okay, let me now uh, move, uh, I'll, I will hand over to you, um, Bernie, and then we move on uh, to some housekeeping rules, if you're okay with that. Of course, of course. Um, Nikki, is it possible to stop sharing and then I'll, I'll share my screen? Thank you. Just to share uh, uh, with everyone, we are recording this event. We hope this is okay with everyone. Uh, we thought that if we record it, we may be able to share it with other people not able to, to be here today. Nikki is supporting us in the background. Thank you so much for this, Nikki. Can everyone see the Hair Plus data slides now? We can, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so obviously we're collaborating with One Health Tech um, this evening, but just to go through um, some general guidance for this evening, which we do at the start of every Health Plus data event, it's important that we're kind to ourselves and others. Um, we highlight that the talk is being recorded. Really happy for you to either have your video on or off, whatever you are completely comfortable with. If we keep questions to the end so that we can um, ask questions in the chat, um, and then I'll manage a QA and a um, at the end. And we just ask that you don't share the Zoom um, room link publicly. Um, we have a code of conduct at Herplus Data. Um, I won't read the whole thing out, but essentially we provide a safe environment, a respectful environment. We don't uh, tolerate harassment of, of any kind. And our mission at Herplus Data is to bring together women. Um, sorry, I'm just going to move the <laughs> camera across. Um, moved to, uh, our mission is to bring together women with a connection to data to provide a safe space where we can support and celebrate each other, sharing experiences and knowledge and establish meaningful connections and talk data. We have seven organisers on our committee for Her Plus Data. Um, I know Sue's with us tonight. Um, myself and Rachel have sort of been um, uh, part of the founding committee and um, everyone gives up their time to volunteer to contribute to the committee. So. Um, thank you to all these wonderful ladies that do that. Um, just a few um, slides of some of our previous events. We got a little bit bored and we were taking video uh, pictures of um, Zoom calls um, in lockdown, so we stopped at, at that point. But you can see some of our in-person events and we're in person again in November. So we're in person uh, November the 10th um, with, at Auto Trader. We have um, Alice Davis, who's a data analyst at Auto Trader, and Sinead Hemming. Head of products, uh, data products at Virgin um, that are um, doing talks on the 10th of November. If ever you would like to speak or suggest a speaker or a theme or topic or collaborate with an event, feel free to reach out. These are the ways that you could contact us. And I'd like to thank support from uh, the business I work for, Evolution Recruitment, um, and the Software Sustainability Institute for always uh, with their support for group events. And then we have a wonderful panel this evening, and I'll hand back to Alex. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Bernie. Just to say, uh, please, if you would like to reach out to our One Health Tech community, um, specifically in Manchester, the Manchester group, please, uh, you can find us in Manchester at onehealthtech.com. Uh, our Twitter account is at um, OHT Manchester. If you want to tag and uh, make any tweet during this event, please use the hashtag um, hold OHT. To two, uh, and please reach out to us if you have any further comment. We are at the moment working on a campaign about recruitment, retention, and upskilling. So, of course, this is part of uh, the events that um, it's it's um, you know key to our our campaign. So, without further ado, let me introduce the panel speakers that we have today, and then um, we will have a, a chat with some some questions. To, so they can share their insights. We will be talking to them for around 30, 35 minutes. And then we will open some space for any um, question that the audience may have. Uh, but please make sure we are all showing respect in all our opinions and comments, just picking up on, on, on some housekeeping rules that uh, Bernie mentioned earlier. As well, if you wanna use the, um, uh, the, the chat to post any question during the conversation, feel free to do that and we will be able to pick them up at the end. Okay, so let me start introducing the panel members today. Hasira, thanks for joining us today. Hasira has 20 plus years expertise in the health informatics sector across a number of organizations, including NHS Direct, various trusts, strategic and commissioning organizations, as well as for CSUs. She has worked in various data management and senior analytic roles and worked on data warehouse mobilizations, national registries, and managed operational delivery for insight-driven organizations. A media background with a degree in media practices and journalism and a postgraduate certificate in health informatics, Hasira also undertook a change leadership six-month training program as part of a selected cohort of managers in the NHS in 2013. She has completed the first in a set of NHS Leadership Academy courses, which was the Edward Jenner program. Hasira's interest in um, equity, diversity and inclusion, community de development, arts and charity, including being on several committees as a trustee and secretary between 2015 and 2019. She's involved with nature and environment groups and a keen activist and regular builder. She writes, produces, and presents a community nature-based show for Bedford Radio. Thanks, Hasira. Happy to, to have you with us. Leanne. Le Dr. Leanne Smith is the Interim Director of Digital at the Welsh Ambulance, Ambulance Service Trust, WAST is responsible for the ICT and data and analytics functions, keeping essential emergency service systems live and operational teams informed, whilst also driving forward the transformation of technology and intelligence within NHS Wales. Leanne joined WAST from Babylon, a, first, a digital first um, healthcare provider, where she was a product director responsible for improving the experiences of patients and clinicians and help shape the population health management program to support a data-led model of delivering care. Leanne's background is in data science and operational research, and she has spent her career applying her expertise to healthcare settings. She has a PhD in mathematics from Cardiff University for research into the optimization of ambulance location and patient survival. She previously led the analytics function at the London Ambulance Service and has also delivered simulation technology and modeling for emergency medical services across the globe with Optima. Thanks for joining us today as well. Deepa Tamp, um, uh, Head of Reporting Technology at Bart's Health NHS Trust, has a varied background in engineering, tele telecommunications and IT. She began in engineering companies, moved into manufacturing, and from there to improvement and management consultancy before focusing on data. Her current role involves looking after all of the technologies behind the reporting. This encompasses providing the capability to build reports for the end users and implementing a business intelligence platform. 
The platform was launched in March with some revolutionary capabilities, such as the fact that is, it is accessible from any device at any time and alerts are generated depending on data. For example, if there is a search in patients, then operation teams can be alerted. Or if a patient has tested positive for COVID-19, staff can be made aware immediately. We spoke to Deepa as part of our um, ongoing series about female technology leaders with the NHS to discuss her route to leadership, the challenges she has faced and her advice to those who follow her. So thank you. You can see that we have a wide range of speakers today and um, let's, let's move on into our discussion. Okay, I will um, start with an initial question and then uh, we move on into um, hearing your experience. If uh, you can all tell us a little bit about your career journey and how you became initially interested in the, in the interface between health and data. Uh, and also if you can touch a little bit about if during this career journey, if any other women have supported your, your, um, your ideas, your experience and uh, the things that you were looking to achieve, uh, we can make a start with that. Um, I don't know if any of you would like to, to start, maybe Deepa? Yeah, okay, why not? Right, okay, so, um, you know, you've given a very nice background of myself, thanks very much. And that's exactly this, I'm coming from engineering background with an MBA, um, highly technical background, but then, you know, I've worked across many, many industries, different segments, uh, started from engineering companies to manufacturing, IT, insurance, banking, um, and then I moved to NHS, which is very, very different from any of the industry segments I worked at. Uh, why did I move to NHS? Funnily, um, when I was working for banking and insurance, um, and I was already into the data journey because, you know, as I moved into different career paths, I just got interested with my, you know, interested in data with my background highly focused in maths and engineering. I just got interested more and more. Um, so sort of I moved more into data. And then I was working for, um, for banking and insurance segment. Um, I always thought that the analysis which is done or the data which is used is, is very, you know, very fluffy. It's, it's more for, uh, you know, it, it doesn't impact life, people's life. And I always thought I should work on something which really impacts people. Uh, I didn't have health tech in my mind, but something which is which closely relates to people. Um, and then I jumped on the opportunity uh, which came across, which was you know actually dealing with data. And I I joined just before the pandemic, so I joined uh, in November 2019. I joined uh, NHS. Um, and from then I've been deep into the data, into the health tech and who would have thought that pandemic has really, you know, that was the time when the data was really, really needed. Um, no one focused on some of the topics before, which now became a very, very important um, uh, for, for, for NHS. So it's, it's been very interesting. People who have influenced me, of course, there have been people who, influenced me and supported me, uh, women leaders um, in my past organization. But I must say, I didn't come across many women in the data subject or in the data topic. Um, uh, of course, you know, this is something we are going to discuss, but we do lack that representation. Uh, but I must say, I've been supported by, I was supported by a number of women leaders uh, who may not be coming from that background, but um, had a good support to move my career in that in this direction. Fabulous! Uh, thanks for sharing that with us, Hasira. Thank you, um, and uh, I I feel really privileged to be among people who've got quite. Uh, an amazing amount of experience between them as well. So um, really nice to meet you. Um, 
So I work at the moment in a commissioning support unit um, for South Central and West and um, lead a team of embedded analysts to support ICBs. Uh, and my journey there was quite convoluted um, between various um, data management roles, I would say I started in. Um, so very much the nuts and bolts of the data architecture, moving things from place to place and all the sort of national local data flows, contractual data flows and unpicking all of the sort of population statistics and data uh, elements that people need to make decisions on uh, in an integrated way. Um, and rapidly it was beginning to consume uh, a lot of um, time and energy to to move data along um, we weren't in a space um, I don't know 20 years ago where we could automate data in the way we do now um, it, you know we had access excel that kind of thing so we were using quite archaic mechanisms to um, support decisions and even looking back on how um, national data flows were only quarterly um, and now they're as fast as they can possibly be almost daily to some extent and, and, and how that has improved our decision making um, is, 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 is a change that is, is good and possibly bad, I don't know yet, um, but my, my entire life um, has kind of been shaped by health inequalities. Um, uh, I was raised in what I would call a, a deprived community um, and having to uh, experience um, near poverty and experience um, issues around uh, access to health, access to education. So I think I'd always been public sector oriented, potentially. Um, so my first role started in the NHS, in NHS Direct, where we were supporting the call centres. Um, and that also gave us an insight on how some of the local services were shaped um, and what people could or couldn't access and why those calls were being um, handled. And, and the kind of things that we had to analyse, understanding the shape of those um, calls and giving us even more insight into inequalities. Um, basically, um, to the extent that we started even looking at trying to um, uh, data warehouse um, all of the uh, petrol stations and garages um, that might hold um, pharmacies or medical uh, um, provision like, you know, chemists and uh, paracetamol, things like that, or even Calpol for, for young children, because in those days, urgent care wasn't, it wasn't as seamless as it might be now. Um, so I think that led me towards understanding, um, trying to understand the shape of um, the data in all sorts of different um, types of organisations. And I, I wanted to see what things were like in a trust um, and worked in a trust and then moved into commissioning. And uh, in terms of the influences there, I think um, one of my role models is actually uh, somebody who's now moved into the um, uh, another blue light sector. Um, I'll name her if that's all right, Claire Chambers, um, who was uh, lead in our tech side for various organizations I've worked in and sort of been following her around a little bit, um, basically. And, um, so I think having a, a female role model um, in the NHS tech space has always been kind of a really warm thing to have and, and, and kind of be able to kind of look up at somebody um, and, and see their journey and say, well, I, yeah, I can follow that. Um, so and she's always been kind of rooted, really rooted and very calm as an individual in, in themselves. So there was not, none of sort of dramatic rise to anything, but it was really nice to see that journey as well. And even in my own organisation, you know, being mentored by, you know, my deputy director and, and people like that um, has always kind of given me some confidence that I've got people um, behind me. And, and weirdly enough as well, it, it's not just people in the sort of senior roles, but people in my own staff direct lines. Um, you know, some of my junior and senior analysts are incredibly talented individuals who constantly challenge things. And, you know, that I, I like to 
say I'm mentoring as well and, and, and hope that I'm being a role model for them to some extent and not holding them back either. Um, so I think it goes both ways potentially. Um, and I hope that I'm also being able to support anybody at that level. Um, but yeah, I think for me, um, health inequalities sort of shapes my outlook. Thank you, Hasira. I will pick up on, on that in, in a following question. Uh, Leanne? Uh, thank you all. Um, I apologise in advance if there's a bit of background noise and have some IT trouble and I'm currently sat in a cafe, so I'm sorry, and please stop me if you can't hear. We can hear things. you well. No okay, problem. Great. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you. So I, I guess my career journey started with a, a maths degree at Cardiff University, followed by a PhD in a branch of maths called operational research, um, mainly because I enjoyed it. I didn't have a destination in mind. I didn't know about the health and um, data and tech space. Uh, I just enjoyed what I did and I really enjoyed the problem solving element of it. And during my PhD, the application that um, I, I applied the operational research to was the location of ambulances in Wales to try and improve patient survival. So that's kind of really where it all started for me. Um, and at that point in time, I was surrounded by uh, some incredible women that set me off on my journey. And in our cohort of PhD students, there were a really good ratio. There were six women uh, and one guy. Um, so really strong, uh, really strong start. Um, and all of uh, those five other women are actually still all uh, really close, wonderful friends of mine and inspire me on the regular, uh, make me a better person. And uh, I also, I know this is about the women in our lives, but I want to shout out to that, that one guy, that one man, because he supported me through that PhD um, and through a really difficult time in my life. And he is actually now my husband. So <laughs> I feel like I had a very privileged, unique experience, um, very lucky to have the six of those people kind of as my foundation and still in my life now. Um, so I moved out of academia, braved the world of industry um, and started in a software company as a data and product specialist and implementing software within the NHS. Uh, and my line manager there, she was, uh, she was amazing. So it's my first year in the workforce. And despite being, uh, she was located in New Zealand and I was in Reading. Um, so quite a tricky uh, thing I think for her to, to manage and line manage me but she did that and navigated that wonderfully and I think one of the things that really stood out for me is that she always asked my opinion so she may not have listened to the answer but she always asked and, and kind of trusted in my abilities and gave me um, good self-belief in that first role I think um, but I, I felt um, as a deeper mentioned wanting to kind of impact people and I think that that was really what I felt I was lacking in that role if we were implementing systems and health and organisations, so I felt quite detached from the NHS. So I joined um, London Ambulance Service to set up their data science team. Um, so they didn't have any uh, sort of forecasting specialists or prediction um, analytics. So, so I set that up and, and later went on to uh, run the analytics function more broadly at the Ambulance Service there. Um, and, and had I had a wonderful few years there. I worked with a, a brilliant director who is one of those people that immediately just puts you at ease, is really high energy, has infectious positivity. Um, and I worked quite closely with her and saw her at her most powerful in a boardroom, you know, commanding the room and, and sharing, uh, sharing updates and, and influencing strategy. But I also saw her at her most vulnerable as well. She was quite open with us as a team and with me and I think that was the first time that I really realized it was okay to show vulnerability in the workplace and and sort of break down that barrier of professional space show things and kind of personal angle as well um, and then from London Ambulance I, I joined Babylon which is a health tech company it was a startup at the time um, and I ran the, this a product uh, ran a product team uh, there, which was a department focused on building the, an app uh, for remote consultations with GPs and with nurses and other clinical specialists. Um, and I think I learned uh, from the, the people around me, uh, particularly the, the ladies in, in Babylon, how to what it meant to lead without authority. So how to kind of run a, a team. It was a large team, but I was and I was accountable for the output of that. 60 person team but I actually only had management responsibility for a handful of those people that matrix management organization meant that they reported into 
other uh, managers across the organization. So kind of really on that journey of how you inspire and influence without the authority. Um, and uh, and then most, most recently, I suppose, uh, I, I moved back to Wales. That's where my roots are. Um, I'm back into the ambulance service. I wasn't really expecting to do that. Um, I wasn't sure if it would be the right move for me. I thought, uh, would it be too familiar? Will it be challenging enough? And I can assure you that, yes, it is. Um, I think the NHS is a very complex system under a lot of pressure at the moment, and it's most definitely uh, challenging enough. Um, so I'm responsible for the, the digital team at Welsh Ambulance Service Trust. Um, and I think uh, Hazera talked about access and accessibility of healthcare services. And I think that that's one of our ambitions as an organisation at the moment. And that, yeah, that really drives me. Oh, fantastic. It, very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to move on into our reflection of um, drawing on, on your experience and in the experience of other women colleagues working in this sector. What do you think have been the highest contributions of women into this field? And what are the opportunities that we still have as women uh, trying to get more involved in data and digital health? Hazira, I don't know if you would like to make a start. So personally, I do feel like it's quite hard to gauge women's contributions, not because they're not there, it's because the the largely the way the industry, particularly health, is that it's it's very much um very big picture kind of headlines of you know robotics over here and lots of very um high concept things that quite often um aren't in train yet their, their ideas their concepts and quite often um most of the time it feels that women in the sector are sort of sitting in there somewhere behind the scenes actually plugging away at getting that sorted out if you know what i mean we, we don't tend to um actually sing and dance about it we're sort of getting on with it if that makes sense so it's really hard to articulate where we've made lots of contributions although the the one lady that has sprung to mind is um the um the um tech um inspiration who started coursera um where you know globally that as a, a mechanism for people to go and learn um tech has really influenced quite a lot of other um, um, uh, platforms that do teaching online. Uh, and, and I think education is, is actually a really key spur for, for women in tech, particularly. Um, and I'm afraid I can't remember the lady's name off the top of my head. Um, but I think also there's, um, there's real, real gaps in how um, things are published um, because quite often the way um, we learn about um, innovation is through highly technical um, influences, you know, people like, you know, um, Matt, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, that those sorts of people who are kind of leading those conversations, um, they tend to be where um, a lot of people are um, kind of going, yeah, him or you know Elon Musk and you know those are the people you hear about those, those are the people making the most noise and actually women are sort of just getting on with it and it's just I don't quite know how to articulate why our behavior is different or we are we behaving differently and we're just not rising above the noise um that's just my thought really yeah I wonder if it's a matter of um, raising the voice and also showcasing the success stories yeah um, I, I don't know what what's your your view uh leanne um so hazera i just love that the, the rising above the noise so I, I thought that was real um I, I guess yeah my my thoughts on this are i i try to uh think about um what is the representation of, of women in stem uh across the workforce and i think yeah most recent statistics are around the 25 percent mark um so you kind of expect to see that relationship between uh, you know the, that percentage of a quarter of, of women in the workforce in, in an aggregate way um, cascades into leadership and I think that that's kind of what Kazara was saying around 
you know, the, the loudest voices perhaps aren't the female voices that we, we hear. Um, so, yeah, I guess personally in, in data teams, so data um, warehouse and data engineering uh, analytics, I've always worked in teams where that actually has been a really good balance um, between uh, male and female. Um, and generally good diversity overall. But I think that in sort of my observations are that in other disciplines, perhaps that's not quite the same. So I think it's a really important question to kind of think about um, it at a more granular level. So thinking about the contribution of women, not in STEM or kind of overall, uh, but kind of in different areas. So in cyber, in uh, information governance, et cetera. So, uh, so that we're not, you know, we are all data people. So kind of thinking about uh, that at an aggregate view, we know that that hides a lot of trends, variation, correlation. Um, and I think that actually being able to dig down and, and check where there are gaps or uh, we're not being represented. Um, but I think also for, for me, there's, there's something about uh, so that proportional representation in leadership. Um, so is that proportion that we see in the workforce being cascaded through into all levels? Um, and, and actually, is that that's not just in the technical teams as well, but in sort of decision making and authority and policy. Is there a representation there? Is there an understanding? there about the diversity that you know brings the, the benefit and also in education and higher education are there role models um, which we've touched on um, and so what can we do more about that in terms of is it culture is it um, around training what can we do to kind of help have that representation not just in the technical areas but in the areas that support us as well yeah, yeah. Uh, Deepa yeah, I, I think, yeah, Hazira is right. And um, there are a lot of women supporting health tech, but they are not seen. They are not, they do not have louder voices. Um, so what we're lacking is the leadership representation in health tech. And um, having said that, our CEO um, was a female, you know, la lady um, who has retired recently, but our CTO, um, is a female and uh, everyone knows about Nightingale and she was you know the key person to set up the Nightingale hospital in terms of the IT setup so uh, there are people but um, uh, there are women in health tech but very few in the leadership role and it comes down to actually um, women pursuing their career in STEM subjects so you know coming from science, technology, engineering, you know, medicine or maths, you know, those kind of subjects. Um, what usually happens is uh, at, until a certain level, they do pursue and then uh, because of you know, other reasons, not being supported well, or it's just, you know, th this, is, this is a stream which, is, which has been dominated by men and they have not been able to voice their opinions decisions and haven't managed to you know reach to that level um, and again haven't found a sponsor maybe or a person to support um, and and that, that's where we are lacking and that's where we need to support other women coming in this field um, and uh, in my previous organization as well, I've supported a lot of people um, and mentored, um, you know, women coming from STEM or, you know, that background, uh, but are trying to reach to a level where they can be responsible for making decisions. Um, and also then uh, bringing other women in the field. Um, I would like to give an example, actually, you know, how um how useful or how diligent women can be in the sector you know one of the, one of the uh, late or female um, analysts working in my teams and her work was is so much valued and is is you know is like the last word for the board reports and all the performance reports so it is valued and when you see the work, it's very high quality, very diligent. Um, it just, we need more of these, you know, more, more uh, female working in the sector. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if women can pursue their career, I, I must say it is rewarding, um, uh, you know, and people do take notice of that. Um, yeah. It is just, just, um, 
it is uphill at a certain level, uh, to a certain level. Once you're there, you, it, it becomes easier. Uh, but it is highly rewarding, I must say. That's encouraging. Well, it seems that uh, uh, women participation and uh, our contribution is, is it's, it's getting there. Uh, we need to keep working, but it's getting there. A couple of days ago, Bernie and I had the chance to join the Healthcare Excellence Through Technology event. And the first thing that quickly uh, stood up uh, was the, the ratio women uh, male. And we were talking with uh, some uh, leaders in the event and they were saying it's getting much, much better every year. Um, so um, this is only, only an example. But um, let me come back uh, to this reflection about health inequalities and of course, uh, data inclusion or exclusion. Uh, it just seems that uh, that is kind of the main risk that we are um, now facing with the um, increased use of technologies. How do you see your contribution and the contribution of your teams or colleagues in this, in this space? I don't know if anyone wants to start. I can make a start if, yeah, fabulous. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm very proud to say that you know from the time I've joined Bots NHS, um, I've made a positive contribution in this field in the sense, um, as I mentioned, you know, in the pandemic, we really depend, we were dependent on data, uh, for NHS, like for all the hospital sites, what they needed, was to know, um you know, who are the COVID patients walking in the hospital? And that could only be done through, through gathering the data, what means is who's being tested and how do we then inform back whether those people are positive or not so that they can make a right decision to admit the, admit the patients in the right wards. So that was something that, you know, the system was something which I implemented um, and also, at the moment, they, they are highly relying on, on those kind of alerts. Um, and also something, uh, of course, my team did was, um, you know, telling the hospital sites how much oxygen they have and which patient needs how much oxygen and what, what you know, the decision they can make based on that data um, how to move the patients or, you know, decision on the treatment. Um, so I'm very proud to say that I've implemented a system which can which can take care of this. Um, uh, people, operational teams, clinical teams, they can access all this data on their mobile devices and can actually access the reports or make decisions on based on the data we provide. And they have they are relying on it. Um, it just builds our confidence that the systems we have implemented is being used and, you know, they are relying on it. They, are, they, they have that confidence of the data. And so I think that that's a positive contribution made by my team. Um, Thanks, Deepa, for sharing that with us. Thank you. Hasira or Lian? Yeah, I've got quite a lot of thoughts on this, so that it might take up two years of my life telling you, but um, I just, my biggest frustration about the governance around data, it means that it's actually really challenging to get data integrated in, in a system quick enough for, to help systems make decisions. In, in some respects. So if you work in a hospital trust, you, you own your own data, you, you can actually join it together in a way that makes some sense to, to, to the system and you can decide how you use it. Whereas we are a processor, a commissioning support unit processes data on behalf of commissioning um, bodies effectively. So we have a lot more loops and hoops to go through before we can actually help the system put the data together but then you get all of the IG um, elements right, and gateways. Yeah. And, and actually what that then does, it, it actually um, slows down the ability for commissioners to really do the hard work of population health 
um, analytics and the work that they need to do with the social care system to help sort out elective recovery, because that then means if you can't put the data together in a timely way across the system, you then get into this inability to make change and intervention quickly enough. You can't make the decisions quickly enough to, to make changes in, in any, any part of the system, whether that's an ambulance service or a hospital trust or a waiting list or, or, or whatever. And we, we kind of have to see the big picture of that. And that's not that we, we don't have the ability to do it. It's just it, the process, the slowness of the process. And I think that's just in pockets, it's very hard. In some pockets, it's easy, depending on how those systems collaborate or work together to get through those barriers. And I think the continuous change in structure within the health service has, has kind it, it does kind of create this, this, odd um mechanism of, of uh, inability to actually manifest some of this stuff um so i think that's that's just a, a wider an issue that um you know we just can't seem to solve as a as a and i know we're a very very big system as the health the whole health sector um public health um GPs, primary care, all of those things, they don't often talk to each other in a way that's integrated. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, parking of data in, in weird places that people can't reach um, a lot of the time. Uh, and I think there's an ethical thing here about being able to use the data appropriately. Um, so, you know, in marketing terms, there are certain things you can't do with data. You can't target people, but because we're uh, a public body effectively you know we have certain um uh governance that allows us to use data because you know we have to use it to help treat people uh, at the end of the day um but the implications of that are when we get into the population health space and that sort of statistical domain what happens when we start targeting care towards people because we think they fit a particular demographic or they fit a particular deprivation uh, or we haven't counted the deprivation in terms of the movement of that deprivation so we've got an assumption for example that you know if if ward one has always been deprived and on the hundredth decile where there's an assumption it's the same people that we're targeting but you know as as a because the data is often quite out of date, most of those individuals may have moved out of area and, and the, 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 the shape of that deprivation has changed. It's a different cohort of people. So I don't know if we're looking at data in, with, with weirder questions. It's almost like we're not asking weirder questions about the data. So there's lots of things in my head that I probably haven't got enough time to articulate today, but those are kind of my biggest concerns. Thanks. Those concerns will drive a change, I'm sure of that, on how we process the data. Um, Leanne? Um, yeah, thanks, Alex. So it kind of going, I suppose, about digital inclusion specifically, I guess I have two, uh, for me, that, that there's two elements to it. The, is the, how do we build digital or data-led uh, products and tools that allow for or in, improve inclusion and accessibility? So, thinking about patient, access to patients, um, access to services. So at Babylon, uh, the mission actually was about putting affordable and accessible healthcare in the hands of every human on earth. Um, and it was, as bold as that sounds, it was about that accessibility and, and actually demonstrated that in places like Rwanda where populations wouldn't otherwise have access to services without having to walk um, your travel for, for hours or days. Um, so actually a digital version of that offered it and, and allowed Healthcare services to be more uh, inclusive and, and provide to, uh, to to new populations. Um, I think that the other element to that, though, is that how do we build digital tools that then don't exclude our workforce who perhaps are as digitally literate? And, and how do we kind of tackle that side of things as well? So, in the Welsh Family Service, we uh, we recently rolled out our electronic patient care record. Uh, so, a whole national pan of um, ambition. Um, and it was it was quite uh, workforce driven, so user centric, um, in that we engaged our, our workforce in how that was designed. But actually, once it was implemented, 
we use rather than it, I mean, it's very exciting that all of that data is there and we can start to look at uh, patient outcomes and population health management as Sarah talked about um, but actually what we did we took a step back and kind of started to use that data for compliance and kind of look at where within our workforce population are there areas where perhaps that digital literacy isn't um, isn't there yet or perhaps it is there is digital literacy but there isn't digital confidence and so are the, is the EPCR is the, is the record being used in the way the tool being used in the way we would expect and using the analytics to actually drill into that and support our workforce rather than just kind of the you know the, the forefront of the mission which is is the patient so kind of helping our workforce because we, we appreciate that that's the foundation of everything and um, so I, I guess for me there's it's those two angles and I think one of the particularly um, in my experience I've kind of found that there is an expectation that digital or, or data is kind of a it's used as a noun in that you it's expected that it's an output so it's a, it's the opposite of analog it will provide me with an output whether that's a tool or a dashboard or whatever it might be but actually digital should be our our, our verb and what we are doing so connecting people or automating or recommending um, organizing information so it, it's really about what is so digital inclusion for me, what is it that we're doing um, in those ways that helps our, our patients and our workforce? Mm, absolutely, I agree. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, an input to take decisions, isn't it? What we what we used to take decisions. Um, okay, we are approaching the, the the last ten minutes of our event today, but wanted to check if there is any question that uh, the audience may have now. Uh, please um, raise it in the chat and thanks for all the comments that we have been receiving. If there is any other question, please um, unmute yourselves and uh, and, uh, and ask the panel members. If not, then I will raise another question. Uh, how, uh, what are the, the things that you would have uh, liked to know uh, 10 years ago, for example? in order to avoid uh, the struggles that you have faced, uh, perhaps the imposter syndrome that you, you have faced uh, during this time. Um, any reflections on this? I just say I love that everyone's nodding. <laughs> we all have them, don't we? Absolutely. Yeah. I, Leanne, I guess you unmuted I, yourself, so go on. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit recently. Um, so, so for me, there are four things and I agree I love that we all we all nodded at that point I suppose one of one of my my thoughts is that pretty much everyone I've ever met has said that they face imposter syndrome and and that's not just the ladies either like I think that that's quite common it's just maybe being spoken about more so it I guess what I would have loved to know 10 years ago uh, is that imposter syndrome is a real thing it does exist but the thoughts that are associated with it are not real so to kind of detach uh, that feeling and reframe that, that would have been really helpful for me to know. Um, the, the other things for me were um, I early on in my career had advice about faking it till you make it. And looking back now, that was for me personally, that was terrible advice. That just does not work for me. So don't listen to those that say fake it till you make it. Um, it's OK that the style might be different, that you you don't have to follow in the, foot, uh, the footprints or the path of others um, before you be, be yourself. Um, the other thing for me was about uh, being professional doesn't mean you need to hide away the personal side of you as well. And that your personality, your personal life, your opinions are all uh, valuable and add quality and credibility to, to you as a, a professional. I think that I, I did it actually a long time to learn. Um, so, and I spoke about the director uh, before that sort of had that infectious positivity. I think that was something that I learned from her. Um, and, and I guess finally, just not to dwell on the mistakes, just to check in with yourself, learn it, move on. And um, yeah, it's all a lesson. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I echo what Leon said, that, that imposter syndrome does exist. It is real. Um, uh, 10 years ago, I would have said to me, uh, myself, um, you know, I mean, that, that's what I did. Just be honest, just pursue what you think is right. Um, 
and you know just just carry on and it's perfectly normal to to be what you are you don't have to imitate or you don't have to be someone you have you can have role models but you have to have your own thinking and you need to just progress on what you think is right just be honest and follow your follow your intuition for what you really want to do thank you uh hasira yeah i think a lot of what um leanne and um sorry i can't pronounce your name yeah. deepa Deepa. um all of that totally chimes um and i think 10 years ago i i probably didn't suffer the same kind of um imposter syndrome because I was probably the only technical person in certain spaces and it was kind of like you know can you fix the cope photocopier because it sat next to me but that's a different matter um but it's just about that authenticity you know follow your own passion um about what matters to you and for me it was always patients have to be centered in anything that we do in the health system because why would you be there if, you, if the things you're doing aren't for the outcome of patients ultimately because even though we typically service commissioners and other people in the system ultimately everything that they do everything that we give them is for patients um and i learned that actually that quite often sometimes people probably or and i've probably been too focused on kind of winning the battle and not the war you know and it's like picking the right battle to win the war if you know what I mean and and I know that sounds kind of combative um but it's more about understanding that sometimes the really long game is worth putting your effort into even if it doesn't feel like immediately it's solving the problem it's that really long game and chipping away at something that is is worth chipping away at and putting your head above the parapet and actually giving a voice to to, to a problem or an issue um, because otherwise you don't solve issues like the Staffordshire Trust by not speaking up. And I think one of the, the curious things about being in data and analytics is that quite often they're the most neurodiverse group in any sector and quite often generally seen as introverted and harder to speak up in, in a lot of spaces and actually finding that confidence to actually say hey you're asking me to massage a number that I don't think we should because this is the reality of it and actually being really really strong-minded mm. about that and being mm. almost um anti-establishment if mm. that makes sense mm. um so that's my take thank you uh, I can see that Charlotte is raising um her hand Charlotte do you want to make a question to our panel members yeah, if, if that's okay. Um, I, uh, Alex um, and Bernie kind of introduced me earlier and mentioned that I was on maternity leave, which I am, and due back next year. But I, um, before having a child, was, was, was a very confident person, I would say, um, you know, and uh, I'm already sort of nervous about actually re-entering the world of health tech because I feel, I feel so out of touch. Um, and also, you know, not just from a, from both a work perspective, but also kind of this environment as well. And I guess what I was going to ask was what um, experiences, if, if, if any, I think you all have, because you've touched on them, you've had in terms of that um, supporting, you know, and, and it is invariably women. I know men do take some time off of work in some cases, but we're still in a situation where it's mostly women who've taken time out of their, their career and, and return. Uh, supporting t those people to, to, uh, to you know championing them because it's it's exactly what you, you know you've, you've all been saying is it's not enough people women in leadership roles well there may be you know good reasons for, for that <laughs> if if there's lack of confidence at a sort of a, a similar age group and that kind of thing you know I, I was a very different person 12 months ago um and I just wonder whether you you so so, so it's about a question is first of all do you do you see that do you see that sort of drop down almost where women you know push 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 then have children come back and actually their their focus is changed which is absolutely fine but but how do you encourage is some of that because of their focus has changed or is some of that lack of confidence because they've been out of the workplace and people have gone ahead of them and that kind of thing um and then so do you see it and also if you see it do you do anything about it in order to and, and 
encourage those women to get back in the in the saddle really as it were thank you Charlotte, would like to pick yeah. that up? Yeah, Charlotte, um, what I would like to say is these are your thoughts and it's, it's very valid to have your thoughts and um, probably others, I have gone through exactly the same. Uh, but what I must say is people at work do support. And once once you're back, you, you may feel uh, very unsupported for a couple of months but what, you, you you will be back quicker in the game than what you think yeah um and this is you know this is your understanding of the situation because you you're not in touch but once you're back it, it comes back very very quickly it's like swimming you will never forget or cycling <laughs> um, it, it's just the fear of getting in yeah uh, after a long gap um uh but i i have a, a um a woman in my team and excellent analyst and she went on maternity leave and she's back this year i supported her like you know doing part time just get, you know just getting in touch with all these topics um and then guess what she's the most demanding analyst so yeah, yeah it just takes a bit of courage to come back and someone to support you uh, but it's much quicker than what you think. Oh, it's nice to know that people are supportive, though, because that's the, it is the fear. The fear is worse, probably, than the reality, yeah. as you say. Yeah, exactly. And here we are in those sort of, uh, these sort of conversations and events to feel supported. Uh, and, you know, it's finding your tribe and your community and, and take the courage to come in. Uh, for people to know, I was in maternity leave uh, a couple of months ago, and Charlotte was one of my main supporters and Bernie. So here we are. Uh, thanks. Uh, we are reaching out. We are two minutes um, overdue. Thank you so much to Bernie, to Nikki, who allowed uh, this event uh, to happen, uh, to our speakers, Deepa, Hasira, and Leanne. Thank you so much for sharing all your experience with us. And to the audience, uh, Charlotte, thanks for being here. We are happy to see you uh, coming back slowly and swiftly and baby growing up healthy and happy. And uh, we are reaching the end of this uh, discussion. Please get back uh, in touch with us if you would like uh, to raise a further question or something else. And uh, hopefully see you soon in the future. I just Thank want to say a thanks to Deco as well. Deepa, Hazira and Leanne, really, really appreciate your contribution. And thank you so much for getting involved. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.